nice to see you all. Thank you uh, to to both um, Kai and Robert. Um, we're Daniel and I have been um, talking about some of these 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 issues that have come up through the the topic here. As Rosalie mentioned, will be the kind of a through line somehow over the course of these discussions. Um, so I, I thought what well, we thought I would maybe start with a couple of questions and then um, Daniel and then we can have some conversation and then we'll have a chance to to hear from any questions from from the audience so um, as uh, so thank you so much for the the presentations um, I used to fly I used to live in Zurich and so I would see that when you see that photo I know exactly where the chocolate shop is and it makes me very um, nostalgic for this uh, this moment but but as Rosalie mentioned my my interests are in in logistics and in infrastructure uh, and so I, I have lots of questions about these things. It's hard to choose where to, to begin. But I thought, um, given the kind of topic that we're trying to address, that um, I, I'm interested if you're willing to, to tackle the, the difficult question that Alice Larkin poses at the end, even though uh, we understand that, that as terminal designers, it's something that is not immediately something you, you have control over. But I think it, it, I would be curious to hear your thoughts on the ways that design might uh, intersect with that question of, of demand, even if even if we know the real challenge is the the fleet, how the the terminal itself might have a role to play uh, in that. I guess I'll start with. Is this working? Everybody here? There's a um, a very promising and interesting trend right now in aviation. <laughs> And that is that there seems to be a marriage forming between ground transportation and airports. And for the longest time, many airports were not accessible except by car or by taxi. And you see it at JFK, you'll see it at, at LaGuardia here locally, but pretty much every major airport from O'Hare to LAX, they are all, they're all either exploiting or introducing ground transportation systems, where whether it's heavy rail or light rail or APM. And I think that speaks volumes towards the movement to try and reduce carbon emissions resulting from cars lined up, whether it's on the Grand Central or on whatever the highways are in LAX. So I'm, I'm encouraged by seeing that, but we're seeing it, we're very definitely seeing it uh, pretty much everywhere, and Europe has been doing that for decades, and I think that there's a lot of lessons learned there that we're beginning to apply here in the States. And I agree. I mean, uh, as I said, you know, it's the, um, you can only cope with this extreme growth in these infrastructures if you have a functioning system of public transport. So we, we've done that in Zurich 25 years ago, um, and also, the government had this vision, you know, in order to push that. So you need a high politic approach to it, so that it's in, in favor, so that it happens. You know, if if you don't have that, we as planners, we can just suggest and say it won't work to increase the capacity by or double the size and just um, rely on on cars. So that's really something. And I, just, I mean, it shows that it works. You know, Zurich has the train station on the ground and has the tram system which was added later to serve the direct suburbs and um, we're doing similar studies here in New York as well you know to, where, how can we improve train line connections to um, JFK or to New York in order to make that better one other quick thought that occurs to me so I have a personal affinity for Schiphol Airport in Amsterdam and the lesson there is that for those of you that have been to Schiphol Airport in Amsterdam, they invented the notion of what's been referred to as airport cities, so that the airport is not solely an airport. It's a place where people go to work, and I think that there's something around four or 5,000 people that go to the airport in Amsterdam every day having nothing to do with the transportation aspect of it. So it's, it's a multi-purpose use of the real estate, which is all served by rail. So I, th I think it's 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 a model. Yeah, I think we'd like to. It would be nice to come back to that that 
question of the airport city. Uh, I would like to ask a follow-up question about the, the transport connectivity issue, because it, it does seem in, in light of the discussion about these climate change questions and these emission questions that certainly finding more ways to integrate, but also finding ways to uh, incentivize non-aviation for regional transit would be part of one of these strategies. So I'm curious if you would both elaborate a little bit on your own experience with the respective New York City airports. Um, I mean, you talked a little bit about, about how uh, LaGuardia, which is an amazing puzzle that you've solved, like it's sort of astonishing that, that, that you figured out this way to make this all happen. But I wonder if you could elaborate a little bit more on the, um, the relationship to the city that way. And I think similarly with Newark, uh, you're both smiling because you, I, I have a sense of some of the challenges, but maybe you, you could talk a bit about Newark uh, and then, you know, since you're both sort of working with the Port Authority, some of the issues around around that, that access and integration question with public transportation because New York is, of course, very different than some place like Zurich. The irony is that JFK has rail access now, Newark has had it for a while, and LaGuardia is the last, the last one to incorporate it. And yet, and I had a slide that I eliminated from this slideshow, but LaGuardia is, if I remember correctly, about four miles away from Central Park. It's the, it's the airport that's closest to Manhattan, and yet the most difficult to get to. So um, we're beginning to remedy, we, the industry, are beginning to remedy some of the uh, obvious challenges that we had. but. It's also a matter of competition. There's a commercial proposition for all of the airports, and I know that there are travelers who, given the choice between going to Newark or LaGuardia, or beginning to elect to go to Newark or JFK, just because it's easier to get to. They didn't want to endure having to sit in traffic to get to LaGuardia. So I think the dynamic and the, the demand, if you will, of each of the three airports is going to be somewhat equalized, proportionally equalized as a result of the uh, transit access. There's sort of two souls in my, my chest, you know, there's the European soul and the American soul, and I always compare that, you know, I mean, in, in Europe you have this direct competition between air travel and train travel, and the train travel has improved so much during the last 20 years, at least in my generation, that sometimes you really think about, you know, do I fly with a, with a plane from Zurich to Hamburg or do I take the ICE, yeah, you know, or go, do I go to Paris with the TGV, with train de grande vitesse, which takes you from, from Frankfurt to Paris in a two and a half, hour, two and a half hours, traveling 350, 350 kilometers an hour, 300 miles an hour, is, which is astonishing, and you enter the train downtown and you leave the train downtown. No connection from the airport to downtown and back. And that's the big challenge in, in the US, especially here in, in New York. Um, having seen what we, we've done here so far in, in master planning for JFK and for Newark, that's the big challenge. And I agree, airport cities, airports going to be in future because that's where the people are. Um, cities in their own right, you know, they, they have a full life cycle that, 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 that is a full life span is not just traveling, it's living, it's working, um, it, they, they're going to be destinations and, and we have the examples all over the world. So getting that commute from downtown into the airport and back better, quicker and more efficient and to a high quality will make all the difference to, to an airport. Will, will you be able to do that in Newark, hopefully? Well, we, 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 are, we are master planners and we can't change the world for, of politics, but we, can, we, we always, I mean, that's our, that's our task, to show what needs to be improved in order to manage these in, enormous increase in passengers' capacities in, in these airports. Okay, thank you. Um, so I'm Daniel. Um, I'm Canadian, living in the U.S., so I also have two souls. My Canadian soul is like angry, <laughs> pessimistic, ironic, and my American soul is like fanless optimism, obviously trying to fit in here. Um, so I'll try to express both of those. So just first, like a couple of numbers that I think get it. So one number is kind of similar along the lines of what Alice Larkin was saying. So uh, what is the like carbon footprint of airports if we think in a, try to make it a bit more intimate. In New York City in 2013, the city canted up all the emissions associated with aviation with LaGuardia and uh, JFK. The city is in its jurisdiction, 
counted up the number of emissions. So it was about 15 million metric tons of carbon dioxide. That is a little bit more than all of the emissions caused by all of the electricity used in New York City. So all of you, especially if you work in architecture or design, have heard that the biggest, ta the biggest factor of emissions in cities is buildings. That's actually smaller than the footprint uh, from, from travel associated with the airports. So then another question I think comes up is like, who gets to travel? And um, there has been, so not every country actually releases data on this issue, but in the UK, airports uh, know and release publicly the data of the social class of the people who travel. UK is very bizarre. They, they allocate letters to social classes, A, B, C, D, E. A are the richest in the UK. Um, so between 87 and 2004, which is the huge expansion of low-cost travel in Europe, um, the number of flights taken by members of classes D and E increased in absolute numbers, increased a little bit. But the proportion of all flights taken by the two uh, poorest classes actually fell from 10% to 8% of the total. So it's interesting. We have this idea that cheaper air travel is democratizing, but what the evidence, at least in the United Kingdom, suggests is that cheaper air travel really just makes it easier for upper middle class uh, and upper class people to fly. And I think that raises this question of inequality. And when I'm thinking then about airports, I think also the terminals, which are beautiful, also have very sort of luxurious stores in them. That seems to be a key part of the airport economic model as well. It's not just that the travel is luxurious, but the terminal feels almost more like a shopping center than a travel center. So I, you know, I wonder if we think sort of in an optimistic vision of the future where we have demand management and so somehow people are not flying as often or flight becomes something that has more to do with, with necessity, whether it's to see family members or to go do important work, how, how do we think about designing the airport that changes? Like, what does it look like to imagine a democratic airport where travel is not a form of like luxury expenditure, but a kind of necessity that we think of sort of civic spirited way, like where the, you know, we have like the word air bus, like maybe air travel is more like taking the bus or taking the metro. It's a public democratic object that people are entitled to, but that is made in a utilitarian sense. I mean, is there any sense of designing airports that does not make them a more beautiful, luxurious thing? Probably not, and and there's and there's a there's a simple reason for it. Um, the the rates and charges that airlines pay the whoever's operating the terminal is pretty much a break-even proposition. The airports, whether it's a port authority or a private operator, they're not making money from the tenant airlines. Their real revenue comes from the ancillary operations in an airport food and beverage, retail, parking, rental cars, all of those things that are associated with the airport, that's where the real revenue comes from. And that's and there, so there's a commercial proposition for it. As far as flying and, and the segregation of the haves and have-nots, um, there's a good news, bad news story with regard to HOK. Uh, Fifteen years or so ago, the firm did an analysis, HOK did an analysis, and discovered that we were spending more on internal travel from one offices. We have offices across the country and around the world. We were spending more on travel than we were paying in rent for all of our offices globally. And that was the moment, the eye opener, at which as a firm, we put in all of these very elaborate, uh, effective uh, telecommunicating Rooms. So we have what they're called ACR, Advanced Collaboration Rooms. Some offices, most offices now have two or three of them. And it has dramatically, it hasn't eliminated because there's no substitute for face-to-face -face meetings in many instances, but it has dramatically reduced the amount of travel that we do for business reasons. Leisure, we'll, we'll keep flying. In a way, airports are, our client always said, window to the world. You know, I mean, you show your country, even sometimes you travel through an airport and you're not there. You, 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 is it, whether it's in a hub, you know, you go somewhere else. So it's always reflecting the country in its own right. But we're trying, as architects, we have the responsibility to, divide, to design or define structures and, and, and infrastructures which can live over a change. So, you know, what we build today will be there probably in 60, 70 years' time, you know, um, th and that's our aim. So 
I kind of have this category of, of, of building structures, which we always think of, which is sort of the primary, secondary, and tertiary structure. So the primary structure is that what you kind of see, you know, it's the main main spaces, the main volumes, the main means of transport. And when, when you do these, a space is good, and, and they have an idea in them, you know, that will stay, that will remain. Everything else can change. So you have to, and that makes probably the impression of being elegant and, and a bit kind of over, overdoing it, you know, but it's not, that, it's not that complicated if you have a great idea. And, you know, that makes the spaces and that makes it efficient and, and has a potential for the future, even after a change. So you just made me think of something else. So there's another element contributing to the carbon footprint, and that's just the mere construction of these facilities, the amount of steel, the amount of all of the materials that feed these terminals, and the investment. Um, I didn't put the slide up, but the budget just for Terminal B and what you saw as part of the privatization project that we're working on right now is about four and a half billion dollars. And it's going to be a similar number for the other half of LaGuardia that Delta, that Delta is developing. So you're talking about north of $8 billion to completely rebuild this airport. And we find ourselves as architects and as builders and, and as owners regularly talking about a useful life of 35, 40, 50 years. That's insane. So it brings me back to my favorite example, looking at Grand Central Terminal, which in 2016 celebrated its 100th year its 100th anniversary in operation, and I submit that it is as valid, as functional today as it was the day it was built. So we have to, as architects, as designers and builders, start thinking about 100, 150-year facilities, not 30, 50-year facilities. If I could maybe just follow up on that, that observation relative to what um, you're both describing around the the kind of, because on one hand I'm hearing the, the need for the kind of civic expression of the airport as infrastructure, as expression of culture, as a kind of repository for uh, something that we hold collectively valuable. And then at the same time, we're also hearing about the budget challenges and the kind of clients that need to be, uh, they need to find a way to survive. So I wonder, and, and so I think the, the vocation of Grand Central is a really uh, powerful example because that was a lot of, one that a lot of us can rally around as something that is this kind of amazing space and as uh, something that, that uh, is this incredible experience. And so I wonder if, if you could both talk a bit about maybe more concretely like ways that you can make a case for that kind of expression if, from the context of, of design. So, so how, do you, how do you argue for that investment in that kind of long-term thing, uh, in that kind of uh, expression, in that kind of sense of it being a civic uh, manifestation, and I, I'm really curious about how you actually try to do that with these clients. Well, one of the things that we've recognized, and you you look everywhere, the airports that are being replaced in the wholesale in the wholesale manner or any infrastructure is because those buildings have failed to adapt to change. They failed to be able to receive transit, to have the kind of spaces that generate the revenue. So. We need to be planning these buildings so that they can adapt to change. And how do you do that? By providing longer span spaces, higher ceilings, um, basically a framework, a, a, a foil for other things to be introduced that we don't know. Technology is changing. We were talking before the session began about cell phones. And cell phones have only been around for 30 years. The first text message was sent 25 years ago, and technology is changing at an exponential rate. We have no idea where, what we're going to be looking at in 10, 15 years. So adapt, designing a terminal that can be reconfigured, or any facility that can be re reconfigured for something that we can't envision is not only the right thing to do, it's the smart thing to do. I sign what Robert just said. I mean, that, that's how we kind of, you know, um, go on to these tasks. And, but that's probably two points to add. Gray energy is the big issue in buildings. And, and the longer they stand and the, the longer they're in use, the gray energy is within the building structure. And probably a second point is to use the right materials, you know, not, go, not to go into composite materials, but into 
um, clear materials like steel, like stone, like timber. Um, and, and that's difficult to convey to, to clients because it's, it's an expensive way of building. It's an, uh, quite, you know, it needs a lot of thinking and, and thought and, and input. Um, but, you know, they're longer lasting elements and you, have, you get more out of it economically and in terms of um, an overall approach. Um, yeah, I think the, these reflections on the long-lasting quality of infrastructure really hit home for me. So I was recently, um, I was in Europe, I was, you know, the, the classic academic conferences on climate change, um, and then doing a bit of reporting um, for a podcast I have on climate politics called Hot and Bothered. Uh, so we did a summer, summer tour, which you'll hear some episodes from soon. And uh, in Vienna, which was, uh, I, so I spent some time in Vienna, it's an incredible city. The carbon emissions per capita are extremely low. Um, Vienna has 1.8 million people, of whom 800,000 hold annual transit passes, which cost a euro a day. Um, so two-thirds of the housing in Vienna is non-market. One-third is owned by the city, and another third is owned by a combination of cooperatives and other levels of government. Um, it's a, so it's extraordinary. And this comes from basically this period called Red Vienna in the 20s, when uh, they used very aggressive luxury taxes, which get to this theme of, of uh, rationing. Uh, one third of the revenue for building public housing, about 10,000 units a year, came from luxury taxes on things like champagne and gambling uh, and racetrack, uh, you know, owning horses or, or going to the racetracks. Um, and so what's really interesting is you have on the one hand in the core of the city this like splendid imperial architecture, and then you go to the outer ring, um, massive beautiful housing complexes. The Red Vienna exhibit was hosted at something called the Karl Marx Housing, Karl Marxhof. Uh, only 18% of the land is actually covered by housing because there was an idea of a right to leisure, but it was local. Um, and so I wonder, maybe we're getting the airport terminal is maybe a bit too narrow. And if we think designing a transport system that is going to last, is that going to be like the palaces of the kind of imperial times, which are ostentatious and maybe cool to visit, but have a certain idea? Or might they look like some of the public buildings? If you think of New York, Robert Moses' swimming pools, you know, a great aspect of New Deal architecture that have really stood the test of time. Like, I mean, I'm, I'm curious how much this even sort of comes up. Like, what is the social idea that is expressed in the designing of a transportation system? And if we think about the use of carbon as being limited and how that can be allocated, you know, what, is the, what are the kind of values that we put into these buildings? And I'm, you know, I'm curious on, on the reflections you might have had over your careers, thinking about how to stamp an idea onto the transportation infrastructure. I would say it's not so much a social idea, um, but the other, the other thing that we're seeing increasingly frequently, and LaGuardia is another example of it, that the cities are seeing or the regions are seeing these pieces of infrastructure as civic buildings. They're not transportation buildings. They're part of the civic fabric of where they are. I, I showed a little bit about Indianapolis Airport. That was a pet project of the mayor, and he wanted that central area that I showed is actually referred to as civic plaza by the citizens. And when the mayor has an announcement to make, he doesn't do it on the steps of City Hall. He does it at the airport. The, air, the airport happens to be only 10 minute drive from downtown. But nonetheless, <clears throat> it's a reflection, and in, in the case of LaGuardia, which has been an embarrassment for New York and all New Yorkers, that is really seen now as it, it's hoped to be an integral part of the, of the civic fabric of the city. So I, I think it's. Maybe the end result is the same, but the motivations are different. Um, I'm trying kind of to look 150 years from now, and I do believe that airports are not looked at as airports as we look at them today. I think because of the developments they take today with the public infrastructure, improved connectivity to, to city centers and, and the sub, suburban um, um, surroundings, um, they will get into um, infrastructure inter interchanging points, and not just um, um, to go to an airport and fly somewhere. You know, we, we probably can't imagine today how big that change will be. It's not just train, airport, and car. There's, I mean, we don't have, we didn't talk about, you know, single pods going there automatically and all electricity and all that business, but it's probably beyond that. So today we think about airports. In future, we will have interchanging hubs 
you know, interconnecting with city centers, with growing suburbs around them, cities in their own rights at the airports, uh, and that will change the way people will look at these um, places in 150, 200 years? How much does the how much does that, uh, do those kinds of discussions happen in the offices? I mean, how do you sort of fold that beyond the kind of long span, high ceiling? How do you, how do you fold in a kind of anticipation of uncertainty or these kind of future changes into the planning of these things? I mean, maybe you could just sort of talk more. I mean, it's, it's nice to hear the con kind of concrete issues that you deal with around that. So. I wonder if you could elaborate a little bit on that. I mean, you've seen the concrete issues are the stuff you've seen. You know, it's, it's the concourse and, and the piers and nice airport projects and flying bridges and whatever, you know, spaces with a lot of light. But we like to do urban planning. We're architects, but at the end, when we do our, uh, terminals, we always think kind of globally, you know. I mean, at least, um, at least sort of two to three hundred kilometers around the airport, how do people get there? How, what, what is the airport actually serving? Is it, 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 is it there for its own right? You know, so master planning in, in our practice is, is one of the big things we, we love to do because there are the visions, you know, and there you can set little seeds which, which ten of them will grow and probably only two of them will be big trees, you know. But if you set the right seed now, like... Uh, uh, I do an example, JFK, a, a brilliant new kind of um, train infrastructure right into the center of, um, of New York City, which isn't there in the moment. It's a nightmare to travel. I mean, I'm not sure how many people try to go with a train to New York, you know, which is, is not a nice experience. But it will, I tell you, in 100 years from now, that will be the way to travel. And probably not to the airport, but to this interchange point. So you asked how, how it works from a practical standpoint in, in the studio. It, I, I think it, it begins with accepting the fact that we don't know what we don't know. And, and I have, there's no better way of characterizing it. And um, we, we have a number of charrettes going on at HOK in different offices. We've enlisted some of the young professionals to and challenged them to solve some of the disruptors that are coming up, like autonomous cars and what happens to, gar to garages when they're no longer necessary. Um, but how many airports have you been to where you're in the gate area and the, the area that's used for seating and the area that's used for circulation is defined by a row of columns? So those are some of the constraints that we eliminate by spending a little bit more or smartly engineering it so it could be single span so there are no columns. So you can redefine what circulation, what seating at a moment's notice. So it's, there's no answer to how do we, how do we look into the future, um, but it's just imagining the worst case, case scenario and trying to solve it reasonably now. Um, it, it's a tough problem. It's a tough problem, but it's one that we have to do. We can't be painting ourselves into a corner. Um, thank you. Um, I love this theme of uncertainty as an opportunity, almost, and then the very long-term future and this, you know, the massive interconnectivity and kind of nodal life. This resonates with so many themes in urban planning, thinking about climate change in the future. Um, so we're going to make a nodal pivot here <laughs> um, to questions from the audience. So we have time, I think, for... Uh, maybe two or three, we'll take in a clump, and then we'll get reflections from our, uh, from our fantastic speakers to those questions from the audience. So um, Ginny's got a mic here. Put up your hand if you would like to ask a question or make a comment. Uh, yeah. Hey, thank you. Um, I, can you hear me? Okay. I have two questions. Uh, the first one is when you're engaging with uh, the decision makers who are approving your project budgets, um, as you're talking about more sustainable features in the architecture, the flow, or the investment, or the HVAC system, or whatnot, what are you sort of, what are useful strategies for engaging and making the sale for going the extra mile for doing that greener design? My second question is 
I know in the shipping and transportation world and ports, there's a big move towards electrification when ships are in port. And I'm curious whether you're familiar with whether there's similar study or interest or even capacity to do like similar electrification of planes so that they're not running their you know, fuel-based engines when they're sitting at a gate between flights. Thank you. Okay, are there other questions or comments? Uh, yeah, okay. Yeah, we'll take one more and then, yeah, 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 we'll just, yeah, we're not dissing his question, we're just going to stack him up for time. So I think there might be wine waiting or something, yeah. I was fascinated by the, the, the amount of attention you put into thinking how the planes would taxi at LaGuardia, and I'm just curious how big that topic comes up, maybe more broadly amongst some of your other clients in terms of thinking about that carbon footprint that you, you do actually contribute quite a bit to when you're running those planes unnecessarily out on the taxiway. So I'm just curious how much that really comes up in the other conversations. Okay, and then one last question there at the back. I, I just wondered, what, how does the acoustics of um, air travel in terms of the planes affect some of this issue of looking to the future? Because I think that the, the noise is a big factor in creating hubs and viable communities around airports. Okay, I'm going to offer my answers to some of the questions in reverse order. Schiphol, I'll go back to Schiphol for a moment. They sponsored competition uh, two or three years ago aimed at young professionals, and the challenge was the community around Schiphol Airport was complaining about the noise. So the challenge was, how do you solve that problem? And the group of them got together, and rather than solving it technically, they solved it artistically. They enlisted a landscape architect, and I'm sure you can find it, and I'm trying to remember where it resides. But what they did is they crafted the landscape around the airport, creating berms and eddies, vegetation, and reflecting pools. So what they created buffered the sound, but at the same time, the waves of the engines landing and taking off created ripples in the water that became part of an art feature. So it was a blending of solving an acoustical problem, introducing art, and rather than trying to create a barrier, they created an enhancement to the whole to whole area. That, that can't be done everywhere, and I think the only other thing that's contributing to the reduction of sound is, is better technology in the aircraft. There are some aircraft now that are much more quiet taking off and landing than other ones were before. Your question about the taxi lanes, we're talking about a lot, we're talking about it a lot more having done it once. Uh, because that came as much of a surprise to us that it did, as it did to the Port Authority. It really was an outgrowth of the construction phasing strategy. But um, I believe that that was a big part of why we were awarded the project, because it was a little bit of insight into how we were looking at a problem that they had been looking at for a long time through a different lens. And then uh, part of the question of how the sales pitch for introducing some of these innovations, um, it's a commercial. It, it's, it's in their commercial interest. It, it will increase revenue. And some of these amenities don't have a direct commercial benefit, but they might, they might make it a more pleasant environment for the traveler. And the operators of LaGuardia have, they have a slogan internally. A relaxed passenger is a happy passenger, and a happy passenger is somebody who spends money. So there's, there's a commercial argument to be made for spending a little bit more money on some of these amenities. I'm sure there are other reasons. Maybe they generally believe that it's the right thing to do, but when all else fails, the commercial proposition is a strong one. Well, it's, a qual it's a quality aspect, and it's a, the big thing about airports, it's, it's running costs. I mean, if you, if you argue certain elements which are well-designed, and I'll come to that in a second, um, and you calculate them over 10 or 15 years, 
uh, you start, suddenly start to realize, oh, that is a, actually a good case, actually. You know, I just do a, a quick example. Um, we changed in Zurich at the time. It wasn't our task. Um, the signage system from classic, what do you call it? If there were one feet thick boxes with light fittings in them, you know, emitting a lot of energy, using a lot of energy. So you had to cool, cool all that energy, which was emitted by these light um, um, signage systems down. Um, down to a system where you uh, had just an LED strip in there with a lighting diffuser. Um, very easy to change because signage is a big issue in airports and you can, can, could really quickly change that. So there was a, a running cost involved in that, there was an energy cost involved in that, and a quality involved in that. So that's just one example uh, and you can scale that up and down as you like and that's the way you actually argue big, big changes or big elements through with a, with a client. And the, and the um, um, question about noise in airports is a, a very difficult one. It's even more probably difficult in Europe because it's so dense, you know. I mean, we, we hardly have so much. I mean, every airport has a, has a surrounding and it has a growing suburb. Um, but uh, growth at airports is not has not just to do with more airports and landing um, frequencies, it has to do with uh, bigger compartmentation of the uh, actual aircraft. I mean, they, they increase all the time uh, and the quality of the t uh, technology. I mean, a DC-10 and an A380 is a world apart in terms of noise, but it is an issue and it will stay an issue because that's, that's a dense area. Hi, um, Robert, you talked in your presentation about net zero um, goals, and then later in the conversation you touched on um, construction management and just the general industry. Um, and maybe this question kind of goes beyond the scope of this talk, but um, what are both of your thoughts on revolutionizing the um, construction industry, and what do you think architects kind of have can have any leverage and actually talking to the steel or concrete industries and somehow making contact with the unions or kind of doing, ma taking steps to, to bring those emissions down because obviously they're very significant. Well, I'll tell you that 10 years ago, if you mentioned silver or gold leader, lead certification to any builder, they would just you know, say, what, what the hell are you talking about, to go away. Now they've adapted it. That's part, that's the minimum common denominator right now. They recognize, they may not recognize that it's the right thing to do, but they recognize that it's something that hey, they have to do to be competitive because clients are expecting it. Net Zero isn't there yet. And the challenge has been laid down. We haven't gotten there yet. Um, one of our sustainability experts in the firm was um, commenting at the last board meeting that what we should do is focus on the smallest scale buildings that we can that we can that we're working on whether it's a visitor center or some other clinic a health clinic because the smaller the scale the easier it will be to achieve and then there are lessons that we're going to learn from that kind of facility that we can start scaling up uh, to get to a net zero uh, airport terminal um, we'll get there but I don't know when one of my uh, one of my partners is fond of saying that talking about airports and sustainability is like uh, fat-free donuts. It's it's just <laughs> it's it's uh, incongruous. But I still believe that we're going to get there. Probably just can add a reference from Europe. I mean, it is in Swit or in Switzerland. Sorry, that's not Europe, but in Switzerland. Um, the government has um, a point system um, in order to uh, award contracts to contractors. Um, it's not just um, the money they offer. Um, they also have to, to tell or to offer in their, in their tender um, how they bring materials to the, to the site. And sometimes they even regulate that 20% of the materials need to go by rail close to the site. Sometimes they build rail systems to the site when it's a really big site. 
um, and what kind of machines they're using. So if the machine is a really high class machine, we call them Cat, Cat 5 machines, which have zero emissions on the site. You know? um, and that is part of the tendering process and is, is, is um, money valued in the tender process already. Um, I, none of you, um, or neither of you who have been answering questions have actually directly dealt with Alice's challenge about demand. Um, so this question is actually to all four of you um, that I'll preface by saying I found that a very powerful thing, um, you know, that we deal with it one way or we deal with it another way, but somehow it, we're going to have to confront that. So. I, I'd like to understand um, what your assumptions are for not dealing directly with that question, whether you think some other sector is going to, you know, cut enough that somehow aviation won't have to or it's just impossible and we're all going to, you know, deal with the consequences. Anyway, this is so. This is for all four of you. I just am interested in um, what your response to her challenge it's, was. I, I think it's a very simple answer to that. Maybe there isn't, but I think there is one. We call it "You're directed by your right back pocket." In a moment, at least in Europe, uh, fuel is not taxed, and the reason why it's not taxed is that in the entire world fuel isn't taxed, so we can't uh, put on tax on fuel, make traveling more expensive, air traveling more expensive, and rail travel cheaper. That's the reason why politics in Europe always say we, we can't reduce that, you know, and, and that, in, in, to be honest with you, I think today air traveling is too cheap. That's a very simple answer to your question in order to kind of steer and, and kind of uh, push it down the demand and push it to other means of transport. Of course, the international travel, we can't bring it all down, but that, that will be a high, very big lever to actually steer it. That's exactly right. The, the demand is not going away. Um, what can change is the mode of transportation and how we get people from point A to point B. And uh, Elon Musk and the Hyperloop. Um, right now, it's kind of edge on the edge, but uh, we, our Chicago office, is actually involved in um, something called the O'Hare Express, which is the ambition is to have a new train that will take you from downtown to O'Hare in a fraction of the amount of time that it takes you to get there on the conventional rail right now. So, the demand. I don't see it diminishing commercially. Businesses might do sort of what we did, and I think they're all, they've all done that to a degree, which is less in travel, but in, you know, not without, without compromising the communication. But um, transportation is here. There are, too many, there are too many attractions, both leisure and business reasons why travel has to happen. We just need to improve the mechanism that we use. Um, thanks. Um, uh, Alice's presentation, Carbon is like a cruel master. It's like the meta moderator of this conversation. <laughs> and thank you for reminding us to answer to it. Um, so, I mean, a couple of things. Like on leisure, you know, there has been a massive democratization of leisure in the 20th century in particular. And what's interesting historically is that initially that was almost all regional. So the huge growth of uh, working class access in Europe and the United States and places like Argentina to the beaches, to the woods, and so on was always regional. It was basically the train out of the city into the woods. Uh, in France in 1936, Jewish Prime Minister Leon Blum passes two weeks paid vacation for the first time in history. Hundreds of thousands of people go to the beach for the first time. Um, and for them, it was an enormous uh, luxury, but it was also pretty proximate. So I think there is a precedent for uh, non-air access to beautiful experiences for people um, that, that I think architects and designers, well, a lot of us can work on. In terms of air travel alone, it's also kind of great. It seems likely that if it is ultimately restricted, because soon every year we'll have a Harvey, an Irma, a Maria uh, in every country, and people will freak out, um, it will either be the burden of the decarbonization will be equitably shared or inequitably. And I think there's a question for all of us about 
if we want it to be equitably shared, what do we, how do we do that? And the current free market system in air travel is obviously not the right way to get an equitable sharing of the right to travel by air. My secret is I don't like to fly. Despite what I do, I would much rather be on the ground. Um, I'm not paralyzed with fear, but I don't like flying. And that's one of the uh, the uh, ironies of, of, what, of my chosen profession. My friend is flying to the Spencer Airport Bar. Um, speaking of, of drinks, I don't want to stand in the way of that, but I wanted to just add one thing around um, what Daniel was saying. I, I do think that the question of where the where the assumption around um, of sustained demand for mobility comes from, and I do think that there's uh, space to wonder about what's driving that and, and how we how we might constitute other forms of desire or other the other sources of, of that, and maybe it's about how we collectively think about what wealth might be or might mean that, that or what, what a kind of satisfaction or fulfillment might be. So, I mean, for me, with some of the research about logistics and fulfillment, one of the questions that drives so much of these industries is a kind of impulsive desire or a kind of um, uh, market-driven, mar market-created demand, which maybe isn't uh, the only one that we can think about. So I think it would be, for me, interesting to think about where, where, where we might try to locate other forms of value and other forms of, of, of wealth in a, in a non in a monetary sense. Um, not easy, but I think that would be for me something to, to try to at least keep uh, on the table around some of the assumptions that are underpinning some of these systems. Uh, so with that, I will um, conclude this session. Uh, thank you so much for your presentations. Thank you for the questions uh, and your, your uh, your participation in this first of uh, four events. So we hope to see a lot of you tomorrow, uh, and, uh, and we'll see you all out in the lobby for some refreshments. Thank you. <laughs>